Turn your Bibles to Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. And you're like, that's not the, where the story is. Romans chapter 10. Well, the story was in Luke 2. It is. And yet, you've already heard it. Luke 2, you've already heard. The question is, who hasn't heard it yet? The question for today, as we celebrate, is, are we going to get so wrapped up in celebrating Jesus that we forget to tell somebody about Jesus? That's the challenge for us today. Is we can get sidetracked really easily by celebrating about Jesus that we forget to actually go and tell somebody about Jesus. The Bible is full of reminders that true celebration of Jesus Christ is proclaiming his greatness. And that deserves to be proclaimed outside these walls, not just inside the walls. So as we're singing today, and as we're worshiping today, and as we're shaking one another's hands, as we ate really good food, we're going to honor Christ and we're going to proclaim his greatness to one another. And that's the first step. But if it stops here, we're just a country club. Except nobody wore sweaters like tied around their shoulders today. We're a country club without tennis. I don't want us to be that. I don't think that's who we are. I know that's not who God has designed us to be. But that's going to start with each one of us individually committing ourselves to what Romans 10 says, reminding ourselves of the people who are right outside these walls, the people who are right down Old Church Road, the people who are right down Jude's Ferry, the people who are in Richmond, the people who are the western part of Powhatan, the people who are in Cumberland and Goochland and Amelia and Chesterfield, the people who are throughout the state of Virginia, the people who are throughout our country in places like Philadelphia, who are in Toronto, in Canada, the people who are in Mexico and Brazil and Argentina, people in Belgium, Muslims in southern France and refugees throughout Europe. People who have never heard the gospel in North Africa and the Middle East. People who have heard a gospel but a false gospel throughout Western Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa. Who have heard that if you just give God your money then he's going to give you a new car or lots of goats or lots of wives. And the gospel has been distorted. And the people in, the people in South Asia, in, in India, who have no access to the gospel because no one's going to them. The people in China who will only hear the gospel if one of their neighbors will tell them under the penalty of possible death. And in Vietnam, where to be a church planter means you will be arrested. To graduate from seminary, you plant a church, which means you will be beaten at some point to get your degree. That's, that's the reality of our world. And this week I was reminded that the shift is not coming. The shift is already here. And I know a lot of people have been up in arms about this whole Duck Dynasty thing, and I told myself I wasn't going to talk about it, and then I just broke down last night. Um, I was talking at our open house yesterday, and I, I've wanted to, I wanted to go two routes with talking about the Duck Dynasty thing, and Phil, who I think is hilarious. Um, and this, this is what I came up with. I, I could go one of two routes. One, if I were to write a blog post or an article... This is what it would be. It would be 10 things that a Vietnamese Christian who is being persecuted would want to say about Duck Dynasty and the problems there. One, you have a TV? Two, you have time to watch TV? Three, 
they let you talk about Jesus in your country without being put in prison? Four. They pay, pay you millions of dollars to be on TV as a Christian? I mean, do you get the picture? And I wonder how much we sit there and want to talk about the shift that's happening in our country when we have to realize that the fact of the matter is the scripture's already promised us that that's going to be our reality. And the second thing I wanted to say was this, and I tweeted this out last night to my seven followers. And um, and, and it's this. And it was just in the midst of hearing everything and watching stuff online, just people talking and talking and talking and talking about it. And this is what I came back to. Two realities, two thoughts. One, what if, what if the devil's ploy, what if the enemy's ploy is not to silence one man's voice, but to get the rest of us to talk about a duck hunter instead of Jesus? What if, what if his ploy is to get us to talk about our civil liberties as opposed to the one who sets us free? Because he wins that way. I refuse to do that. I refuse to stop talking about Jesus Christ. And if that means I go to prison for it, I go to prison for it. That's what people are doing all over the world. Second thought I had was, and this is where it hit home for me, I'm not quite sure why most of us are so concerned about our right to speak the truth of the gospel because most of us aren't doing it. We're not using that right anyway. I feel like Christmas time is the time for us to remind ourselves that Jesus came for everyone, every nation, tribe, tongue, even GQ writers and politicians and homosexuals. He came for duck hunters. He came for city boys. He came for everyone. I think Christmas is the time for us to remember that, that what we see, Tim Keller puts it this way, that what we see at Christmas is that the Word of God becomes killable. The Word of God becomes killable in the form of a baby to die for our sins. We see that the world can't save itself, but needs Jesus. That's what we see at Christmas time. And I think we forget it. I think we forget it too easily. And so in Romans chapter 10, I just want to make this as simple as possible. Romans chapter 10, there's a, there's a mention here of Joel chapter 2. I'll tell you a little bit about Joel chapter 2. In Joel chapter 2, there was a shift in the culture that had happened. In Joel chapter 2, the people of God seemed lost in the wilderness. Not literally, but figuratively. They seemed like the world had crashed in around them spiritually, that God was not visible anymore in his work around them, that the world was going to hell, and they didn't know what to do about it. And in Joel chapter 2, we are told, very simply, be glad, O children of Zion. In the middle of all of that mess, we're told, Be glad, O children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has given the early rain for your vindication. How perfect. Today. He has poured down for you abundant rain, the early and the latter rain as before. The threshing floor shall be full of grain. His blessing is going to be pour, poured out on you because you are his people. Verse 25 of Joel chapter 2 says, I will restore to you the years that the swarming locust has eaten. Not only is he going to bless us, but he's going to restore all of the things that have been taken from us. So be glad, O children of Zion. Verse 26, you shall eat in plenty and be satisfied. And praise the name of the Lord your God who has dealt wondrously with you. And my people shall never again be put to shame. Whether you're a duck hunter or a Vietnamese church planter. Verse 28 says, 
or verse 27 says, You shall know that I am in the midst of Israel and that I am the Lord your God and there is none else. The good news of Christmas is that came true. That the Lord God came into the midst of his people and there is no one like him. This Christmas, do not mistake anyone for Jesus. Do not mistake anyone or anything for Jesus Christ. Verse 28 of Joel 2 says, And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. We see part of that being fulfilled in the coming of Jesus and in the coming of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, that the Spirit of God is poured out on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. Even on the male and female servants in those days I will pour out my spirit. Did you catch that? Even on the male and female servants will I pour out my spirit. It's not just for the people who are the people of God now. It's going to be for everyone. He's going to open the floodgates. That's what we're looking forward to is him to open the floodgates of his blessing and of his spirit. Verse 30 says, I will show wonders in the heavens and on the earth, blood and fire and columns of smoke. Isn't it interesting? We look at those things, blood and fire and columns of smoke, and we wouldn't call them wonders. We would call them tragedies. And he calls them wonders. I'm going to show you how strong I am through all of these things. We tend to look at those things and go, oh, no, what's happening? He goes, um, I've been telling you for 3,000 years what I was going to do. And they're called wonders. I'm going to show you my power. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Romans 10 uses that phrase. And this is what it says in verses 13 through 17. I want you to follow along with me because I want you to see the connection here. In the day of the Lord, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. We're looking forward to that day when all of these promises are fulfilled. We see them fulfilled in Jesus and Jesus is going to return. He's going to set everything straight. He's going to vindicate his name. He's going to vindicate his people. He's going to set it all straight. He's going to restore and he's going to bless and his spirit is going to be poured out and he's going to do that. And we long for that. Anybody else waiting for that day to happen? We want that day to happen. We want Jesus to come and make it all right. And in that day, those who call on the name of the Lord, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Romans 10 verse 13 says this, For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And then verse 14. How will they call on him in whom, whom they've never believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they've never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. They've not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us? So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the world, word of Christ. Oswald Smith, the Canadian pastor and theologian, put it this way. We talk of the second coming. Half the world has never heard of the first. <laughs> I want Jesus to come back now. I don't need to celebrate Christmas. I don't care that I brought the presents already in there under the tree. Well, most of them. My sister's presents haven't gotten in here yet. I'm really hoping they get here tomorrow, okay? But don't tell her that unless she watches it online. Okay. Um, I don't care about what I've invested in this world because what I'm told in Joel chapter 2 is that anything that was taken from me, I get back. He restores it all. And what, we talk, what we're told from Jesus is anything that I, gets taken from me or that I give to Jesus, I get back a lot more than I gave. So this, this Christmas is an opportunity for us to take Romans 10 seriously in the light of Joel chapter 2. 
The day of the Lord is coming, and those of us who are in Christ Jesus long for that day. We've lost loved ones. We want to be together with them along with Jesus. We want to see them. We want to worship with them. We want all of that, and I'm longing for that day. Now, more than I ever have in my entire life, I want that day to come. But in that day, according to Joel chapter 2, those who call on the name of the Lord will be saved, and some people won't know who to call on. Because we're not going. Because we're not telling them. And Romans 10 says that if we don't tell them, no one will. The world is smaller than it's ever been. Through the internet, through media, the world is smaller than it's ever been. We can get to places now quicker than we ever have been able to in the past. And we're doing less than we've ever done. There are people who had so far fewer resources who have done so much more. You have a commitment from me as your pastor. That if the Lord grows our church, and I pray that he does, and I see that he is, you have a commitment from me that if the Lord leads us and we have to build out from here, first thing we're going to do is we're going to look to plant a church and we're going to look to spread the gospel someplace else other than at the end of the street. It's the first thing we're going to do. But if we need to build a new building, you have a commitment for me and you can hold me to this right now and I will hold you to this, that for every dollar we have to raise for a building, we will raise a dollar to send to missions so that other people will know. If we have to build a $2 million building, $2 million is going to make sure somebody hears about Jesus Christ. We don't know when that day is. The shepherds on the hillside had no idea what was going to happen that night. When that angel broke through from eternity into present day, from transcendence into eminence, from being out there somewhere to being in their face, the whole world changed. And one day it's going to happen again. Will they know who to call on? Will they know whose name to call on? So today this is for two groups of people in our church. One, maybe you're the person who's never heard. Or maybe you're the person who's heard the Christmas story and you think you've heard the gospel. But my feeling is that if you're in a church and you're not following Christ, then you probably never heard the real gospel. Because if you heard the real gospel and you still show up on Sunday morning and you're not following Christ, you, 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 you'd feel really uncomfortable. Because the real gospel ends with this statement, if any man come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. And that gets really uncomfortable to hang around people who are doing that when you're not. So the first may be for people who have heard the gospel or snippets of it, or maybe you've never heard at all. I want you to know this. The story of Christmas is this, that the one who made everything made himself, he humbled himself to put himself in the form of a human being so that he is fully God and fully human so that he could die in our place so that every good act, every bit of obedience in his life would end up in the end being credited to our account if we trust him. So when he obeyed his mother and father, he did that because he's God in flesh. And so when you've disobeyed your mother or father, if you have faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, it's as if Jesus' obedience is now yours. And that happens by faith. It doesn't happen by you being really good or trying really hard. It happens because he's perfect. And he died the death you deserve. And he says, that's for you. So the baby lying in the manger is truly the thing dreams are made of. Because you no longer have to hope for it. You can possess it. You don't have to wait for life. He becomes life. 
But he not only died in your place, on the third day he defeated death. And there are so many among us who have felt the pain of death. And yet there's real hope and there's real life for those who die in Christ Jesus. So maybe you're here today and you never heard it that way. You've always heard, well, if you just trust Jesus and try your best, or if you just do the right things and you go to church, I want to apologize to you on behalf of every church you've ever been to then. Because that's not the gospel. The gospel will never be just say you trust Jesus and try your best. The gospel will never be that. The gospel is he's done everything on your behalf. So trust him. Surrender. Stop trying to be good and trust that Jesus is perfect. And he's perfect for you. So that's the one group. The other group may be those of us who have heard the gospel and have believed the gospel and have trusted Jesus. Who are we going to tell? Who are we going to tell? Maybe it starts, and I want to give you this, maybe it starts this week with your Christmas celebration with family. Maybe that's where it starts. Maybe it starts with your kids. Maybe it starts with your extended family. Maybe you've never had the tradition inside your family, whether it's your immediate family or your extended family, to make Jesus even a part of what you're doing. Not just a part, but maybe the whole purpose for what you're doing. This is a chance to do that. This year is a chance to do that. Say, Jesus is the one we're waiting for and longing for, and it may just be that somebody in your family has never heard what Jesus has really done for them. Um, in the back, there are little booklets. There's little red booklets. Some of you got them as you came in. Some of you got them last weekend. Take that home and just read through it. The real Christmas story. Read through that. Read through it with your family. Open up Luke chapter 2 and read through what Jesus has done as he's come to us. Get a children's Bible. Like, seriously, right now for $1.99, you can download the, the Kindle version of the Jesus Storybook Bible. And I would encourage every single person in here, if you don't already own one, put it on your computer, put it on your phone, put it on your Kindle. I don't care. Just get it. And read through that with your family. Read through it yourself. Tell someone the story this week. And the second thing you can do, give. Because if you can't go to certain places, there are people who are already going. And there are people who are waiting to go. There has been a shortfall in giving for years. And there are missionaries waiting to get on the field. Let's do something about that today. Let's do something about that. Let's just say, I want to commit to make sure that people go and hear and others will hear the gospel because the day of the Lord is coming. For those of us who are in Christ, we're waiting for that day. But on that day, everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And some, many, in fact billions, won't know whose name to call on. So in just a moment, the deacons are going to come forward to take up our offering. The choir is going to sing. We're going to celebrate. We're going to honor Christ. The choir's going to sing two songs. We have plenty of time to think about this and to pray about this. And if, you, if, the, if the plate passes you and you say, you know, the Lord's led me to give this much and he keeps working on you, give. Hey, if you have a Christmas gift you've already gotten and you don't like, just remember, you can go return it to Kohl's. <laughs> that's where every Christmas gift comes from, right? I mean... Every kiss begins with K, every cheap Christmas gift comes from Colts, right? Because they get the 20% off and you get the, right, everybody gets the coupons. You can go to Coles and return it. They're open. And make sure, yeah, 24-7 until Christmas Eve, right? Yep, there you go. 3 o'clock this morning, we're all meeting up at Coles, and we're all going to give more to the Lottie Moon Christmas offering. No, we, we have the opportunity. Make sure someone hears of Jesus Christ this Christmas. I'm going to pray as the guys come forward. Father, I pray that you would be honored in us. Lord, we, I, I love the fact that we can laugh, but Lord, this is a heavy thing to know that there are billions who have never heard and will not hear unless we give 
and go and proclaim. Make us faithful. Make us faithful that they would hear that Jesus has already come as we wait for Jesus to come and set all things right. We pray in Christ's name.